Yes, good morning, good Caroline. morning everyone. A very warm welcome to the webinar uh, towards a future proof inland waterway transport sector in Europe. I'm very happy that you will join this Renew uh, Europe webinar. And we have some great, great speakers here today. We have the uh, European Commission, we have the Deputy Transport Minister of the Czech Republic, we have two uh, river uh, commissions. We will uh, dive into the innovation and research and development aspects with the Dutch Expertise and Innovation Center for Inland Waterways and the Waterborne uh, Technology Platform. Well, we, we round up the speakers list with pictures from the European Federation of Inland Ports and also the Dutch Inland Navigation Organization, the NPRC. So a, a full program and Hopefully it will be very energetic because we have so much speakers, but very short time. We have around an hour. We will have uh, a lot of pictures, short pictures. So hopefully you are uh, joining it and uh, love the interaction also afterward. So thank you again the time for uh, taking the time to be here and to give your insights about our common good. I suppose I can say that of making our inland waterway sector future proof. I think that's the most important thing we share. And why is it now so important to do this? That we organize a webinar like this and discuss the recently concluded Renew uh, Europe paper that was specifically focusing on this uh, topic. Um, for Renew Europe, uh, and to be honest for me personally as well, this is an important topic. The paper, and I wrote it with a lot of pleasure. I had a lot of information from, from stakeholders, I suppose also from many uh, from the audience. And the paper clearly shows the value, but also the potential of the inland waterway sector. And it touches upon many, many aspects. I suppose that many of you already uh, read this and read this paper. So it focuses on infrastructure, transport, good passengers, mobility, uh, model shift and it basically looked at the entire uh, European Union waterway transport system as, as a whole. So, um, and the sector is already making a big, big step forward. Uh, and for example, yesterday I participated also in a webinar of the Corridor Summit and also the, the Rhine uh, Consortium took part this cross-border cooperation between uh, the province of South Holland, German state of North Rhine, Westphalia, and the private sector, they aim to realize a market-ready hydrogen ships and also the infrastructure along the whole uh, Rhine Alpine corridor, which goes from Rotterdam, my own city, I'm right in, here in Rotterdam, to Genoa. So this kind of cooperation is remarkable and in my opinion, one of the great examples we have, and I hope to hear many of these great examples in the next hour. So I think it shows that we can achieve our goals. We set also in the Green Deal by working together across the borders, across sectors, and across the multiple levels of governments. Um, well, I said that, uh, I will introduce uh, the, the program. I will introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, each of them has, well, what I said before, a maximum of five, five minutes to present their, their topic. And after that, there will be an, an a round uh, and an open floor for the debates. And then, well, you can fire all your questions. A small point of order. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, when you put your question in the chat box, please be so kind to, to request also to who uh, to who you mention the name of the speaker. So mention the name of the speaker who you address your uh, question. And maybe another point what's relevant, there will be a translation. So I think that's relevant as well for you. Uh, so we have translation available in English, but also in French. So you can choose the language you prefer. So uh, feel free to check that in the interpretation. Um, last but not, uh, I would like to say I, well, of course, I'm very happy with the support of Renew, but especially also from my 
colleague from Spain, uh, Jose Ramon Bauza. He will join us later on. Uh, so because we have a very busy program with an upcoming hour, I would like to say, let's start. And I'm very, very happy and very pleased that we have uh, Mrs. Kopczynska from the European Commission here. She is the director for the Waterborne Transport uh, DG Move. And I'm very happy to give her the floor. Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Caroline. Good morning to everybody. How could I refuse uh, the chance to participate in an event uh, that touches on, on the, uh, the heart of what we are busy with at the moment, of which I will tell you in a second. But thank you so much for the invitation. And it's a, really a great pleasure to be here with you today to share my views, but more importantly, to hear yours on how to shape the inland waterways transport of the future in the EU or maybe how to shape future-proof inland waterways transport in the EU. I think both, both lines work. I need to start with impact of, of the COVID crisis because I don't think we can, we, can, we can try to pretend that it doesn't exist. Everybody has been affected by the coronavirus pandemic and with several member states uh, starting to have now new transport restrictions measures in place, uh, it will continue to have huge repercussions uh, from today onwards. In addition to the human and social costs, economies and public finances are also under considerable strain. Like all other sectors of the economy, inland waterways transport has also been impacted by the crisis. The impact of this pandemic has been estimated to a total loss of turnover between 2.2 and 4.4 billion euro, considering a 90% reduction in passenger transport and then 25 to 30% reduction in freight transport during the first part of the crisis. I think we should always have those numbers at the back of our heads when we talk about the sector. Uh, the Commission will need to reinforce its support to the sector through an ambitious action uh, programme. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have declared transport workers essential to our economy and we have been requesting member states that those uh, transport workers are protected in doing their jobs and, and are not required to observe quarantine when travelling to work. We keep recalling it this, we will keep recalling this, even with the new restricted measures that I mentioned just a while ago, because without a smooth functioning of our supply chains, our economy will come to a halt. But uh, in addition to that, in May, the Commission proposed an unprecedented recovery package to kickstart the European economy. I say unprecedented because it included a proposal of 1.1 billion euro for the new multi-annual financial programming period, as well as 750 billion for a new recovery instrument, next generation EU. The political agreement reached in July European Council, then reconfirmed at the end of the year, maintains the overall level of ambition and represents an enormous achievement. And here, of course, uh, political support from the European Parliament has been crucial. The recovery and resilience was central pillar of next generation EU. With a total budget above 500 billion, the facility can benefit all sectors of the EU economy, including inland waterways transport. To access the facility, member states should submit the recovery and resilience plans, and we are now waiting for those to arrive at the European Commission, outlining national investment and reform agendas for green, digital and sustainable recovery. So now let me talk briefly about that green and sustainable and smart aspects that directly relate to inland waterways transport. You will know by heart by now, I'm sure, the level of ambition stemming from the Green Deal communication, which is calling for shifting a substantial part of 75% of freight transport from road to inland navigation and rail. And navigation from 2021. Over 75% of inland navigation in the EU consists of cross-border transport, so EU coordinated actions are needed and necessary to reinforce the EU single market. Rules have been developed in various international basins over a long period of time and further EU actions will result in less, less redundancies and barriers, hopefully, 
better cross-border traffic and should also widen EU digital harmonization for an increasing role of inland waterway transport in the transport system. That is exactly the, the, the thinking that we have also put in the strategy on sustainable and smart mobility, which was published on the 9th of December last year. The strategy includes ambitious measures aimed at significantly reducing CO2 and pollutant emissions across all transport modes to reinforce the 55% uh, decarbonization target agreed upon uh, in the climate target uh, plan put forward in September by the European Commission. As one of the most CO2 efficient forms of transport, we need to unlock more of, of untapped potential of inland waterways. Today's share of inland waterways in freight movement across the EU stands just above 6%. And I very much hope that we will be seeing it increase in spite of all the problems and challenges related to COVID. Um, and now let me let me talk briefly about Nayades Tree because I know this is something that the sector is very much looking forward uh, to see and to read and to, to help us with implementing. Sustainability and digitalization, again, the twin focus of the Green Deal of the mobility strategy will also be the key focus of the new NIADES um, program, uh, the Inland Navigation Action Plan for 2127, that's the full title which will also be aligned to the new multi-annual financial framework. As many of you among the speakers, but also in the audience know, we, we are not taking the contents of the program from the, just from our heads. We have been talking to you for quite a while. We have uh, we are building the program on the NIADAS expert group recommendations and also on various discussions with EU member states. The recommendations that you will see in the NIADAS program are actually quite close to the ones a Renew Group is proposing, almost um, dangerously close, I would say. But uh, seriously speaking, what, what it is that we want, want to see happening in the sector? We want more people and goods to be moved around by inland waterways, but for that we need, we need infrastructure that is fit for the future, and we need infrastructure that better integrates this transport mode with others. We need increased digitalization, which will facilitate multimodality, and we need a more efficient use of different modes to get goods to where they are needed. Infrastructure must be sustainable, must be adapted and adaptable to climate change, and must avoid damages to the environment. With these objectives in mind, we will look to close missing links in inland multimodal terminals. And we will also be uh, trying to make data sharing across modes easier and more, and more widely applicable. With adequate infrastructure in place, the modal share of inland waterways transport will increase. This will be good news for your sector, but it will, it will also be good news for European transport system and for European citizens, because modal shift will cut congestion and pollution, will provide safer, more reliable transport option, will create quality jobs, and will contribute to the construction of a more sustainable transport system as a whole. I, um, I must not uh, forget uh, to mention the, 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 the issue of, of gradual shift to zero um, emission vessels, which will be the second strand of the action plan. We need, again, a coordinated transport and energy policy for that, that pulls resources together. It uh, will call for an action not only on the side of vessels, but also on shore. I believe inland ports can become energy hubs for alternative fuels to power tomorrow's vessels with clean alternatives. They will also have a key role to play in greening city logistics. Investment in infrastructure, new fleets will be needed both from public and private funds. Greening is not cheap, but greening is the only option we have. And especially in relation to private funds, I very much hope that today we'll hear more from you what can be done and how we can help the many SMEs that are active in the sector uh, in accessing financial support for green investment. Our new rules regarding taxonomy will be a helpful tool to classify those investments. We'll also be looking into ensuring shippers and consumers uh, with uh, access to good knowledge of the carbon footprint of various transport and logistics options so that they know what to choose and when and how. This transition towards zero emission vessels and decarbonization of the fleet must uh, undermine neither competitiveness nor safety. 
So we will be looking at how our legal framework can be adapted to new vessel technologies coming on the market for a quick and safe deployment. We experience already with test cases of hydrogen powered ships in Germany. I very much hope that those test cases will be very soon repeated in other EU member states and then gradually will become a market reality, will go beyond the testing. I would also like to, to express our thanks to CCNR member state for setting ambitious targets in the context of the Mannheim Convention of the, adopted in 2018 and to work on an ambitious roadmap for the deployment of zero emission technologies. However, as I already said at the beginning, 75% of freight transport by inland navigation is cross-border. It means that we need that response at the EU level and it means that we need all of you in different river basins to work together with the Commission to make sure that we have an ambitious roadmap with clear investment needs and timely related financial support linked to it. This concrete roadmap could also be the cornerstone for any member state support for inland waterways uh, transport in the recovery package. I very much hope that the NIADES uh, action plan will see the broad and official light of day in the next couple of weeks and that's why also today's event is extremely timely because this is almost the last moment when you can add to all the useful input that we already had from you. So I'm gonna sit here and listen very, very carefully and take notes of things you're saying. And I look forward also to the discussion afterwards. And Caroline, I apologize for going over my time, but it's impossible to be brief when I talk about inland waterways. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Magda and Ms. Kaptinski. It, it, was, it was a pleasure and super to hear from you. Uh, all the, 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 the effort you put in, in the sector, the task is enormous for the, for the Commission, but you have our support, you know that. So I was very pleased also by the fact that you mentioned Nayares. You uh, also mentioned, of course, the SMEs, the important role of SMEs, especially now. And yes, one of your quote was, greening is the only option. So. Uh, lovely uh, word from your side and I'm very uh, happy that you will join till the end so also for the audience she will be there for questions as well so thank you for that and now I'm happy to move on to the next speaker uh, I'm very honored and grateful uh, also thanks to the efforts of my colleagues in the in the renew uh, delegation uh, Andre Kovarik uh, thanks to him we uh, I'm very honored that we have the Deputy Minister of Transport of the Czech Republic, Mr. Sechter. I would like to give you the floor, Mr. Sechter. Thank you. Good morning, uh, uh, members of the European Parliament. Thank you for organizing this uh, seminar or conference. Let me say a few words on this important topic from the Czech and Central European perspective. I would like to thank Renew Europe for, especially for the position paper. A lot of work, a lot of content and invention in text, and it was widely discussed among us, among experts in the Czech Republic. And I thank our member of European Parliament, Andrzej Kovacic here. <clears throat> he already sent me the first draft of uh, this position paper in November and we have had uh, enough time for, for discussing it. Inland navigation is a transport mode which can still offer its free capacity to enhance and expand cargo transport with, with other transport modes, especially road transport. The general target of climate change mitigation should be further supported by innovation of inland navigation fleet, supporting deployment of alternative propulsion systems and alternative fuel systems for the inland waterway transport, as well as by implementation of operational measures, for example, enhancement of river information services and interconnections with information system of other transport modes. To help transfer a significant volume of freight from roads to alternative modes of transport, and Water transport, according to the EU Green Deal, uh, we should <coughs> respect as a matter of principle that we want to maintain our existing shipping capacity and, where is possible, expand, supplement, and network 
with our neighbors' projects, especially on the Elbe River and Oder River in Central Europe. Here, we need clear support given technology. In the infrastructure, infrastructure and others. In all our infrastructure improvements, we respect natural. On the other hand, we hope for more understanding and support from the European Commission, especially when it comes to the increase. Elbe is here, but uh, Oder River not. Not only we need to consider the targets of the European Green Deal. The Czech government sees the opportunities, especially on the Elbe River, which plays a very important role for cargo transport between Prague and Hamburg, demands satisfaction, and where target parameters should be settled cross-border <clears throat> on both Czech and German territory by means we are now to prepare bilateral treaty on shipping transport on, on Elbe River. German and Czech government. Another example for the development on inland waterway system, Moravian Silesian region in Central Europe, where the Oder River should be further developed in order to enable navigation to and from Poland and the rest of European inland waterway network. I would appreciate it would be taken into account during the process of revision of the NT network. In line with the Model shift, we should focus on capacity for freight transport on railway as well in inland waterways plus rail waterways intermodal transport in order to create the condition for, for use of rail and uh, rail transport and water transport and uh, the requirement to transfer 75% of road freight to rail and waterborne transport. We need international interoperability, which is, which is also important element to increase the competitiveness on, on transport mode or railways. On the other hand, we want to focus the contribution which uh, inland waterway transport can make already today towards a climate and environment friendly freight and passenger transport. On the other hand, we want to discuss which steps are necessary to ensure that this mode of transport is well equipped to become even more innovative in the future. My country supports the fundamental goal of uh, European Commission Green Deal. Uh, that means a significant part of freight transport shift from road to rail and inland waterway. And in this context, for the negotiation and the European le level, we require a solution of investment incentives leading to modernization of the inland waterway fleet and infrastructure in order to achieve the set objectives. Practically, all infrastructure measures in Central Europe to improve the shipping on the Elbe or Oder River are met with strong resistance from environmental organizations, which also includes some politicians. In contrast to the Western European countries, this resistance is really mostly ideological. The ships are seen as an environmental risk, and the environmental organizations have the goal of leaving the rivers as intact as possible to nature development. That's mean without ships. I'm convinced that inland navigation will play a key role within the European transport in the future and will help to improve the efficiency of transport as well as environmental aspects. Thank you very much and greetings to the guests. Thank you, thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Sechter. I think it was uh, very useful for all of us to hear such a voice from a country which is so important in the European Union, especially uh, for the inner waterway transport sector. So many thanks for, for, for giving your vision about the sector and also especially uh, your reaction on the Green Deal. Um, Let's move on to uh, our third speaker. Uh, I know him very well. It's always a pleasure to, to visit him uh, when I'm in Strasbourg, but unfortunately, uh, it's not possible in these, in these days. But Mr. Bruno George is the Secretary General at the Central Commission of, for the Navigation of the Rhine. The CCNR is here. Uh, and I'm very happy to, to have him here and that we will give a short presentation 
and I guess a very energetic uh, pitch about the importance of our sector. Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. We will see if um, if your hopes and uh, expectations are fulfilled. But you will allow me first, technically, to try to share with you a PowerPoint presentation, if you don't mind. Does it appear on the screen of, all, of everyone? I think so. Huh? Yes, Bruno, that, we can see that, the, uh, the presentation. Thank you. That is fine. And thank you, Madam, also for the initiative and the opportunity today. And a great morning again to, to all uh, attendants. I chose to focus my presentation today on this uh, central uh, topic of uh, energy uh, transition for inland navigation. Uh, that is cross-border by definition, as uh, Magda uh, uh, highlighted already, and the need to develop a suitable, appropriate roadmap for the reduction, elimination of emissions, CO2 emissions, but also pollutants by 2050, very much in line with the goals and ambitions of the European Green Deal. On these matters, the CCNR uh, has engaged internally, but also with the, the assistance of well-established consultancy uh, firms and a, a large intake input from stakeholders, including the European Commission, but also uh, many others, um, a number of studies and activities. Although these activities and studies are not all completed yet, it's a matter of months. We expect uh, by Ju June this year to complete them. There are already a number of lessons that we can draw. When we speak of energy transition, what? Ah, oui, voila, please. Uh, I need to move on. Voila, please. When, when we speak of energy transition, we, we mean, of course, technical innovation. That was highlighted already uh, by previous speakers. To, to support this technical innovation, we know that already today, a number, a great number of solutions are available. Although these are available, they still mean a lot of, uh, of things that, are, that appear as obstacles. We know that they mean higher investment costs and operational costs. We know that they are facing uh, different levels of maturity for the fuels and for the, for the techniques involved. We know that they also imply uh, important, appropriate bunkering facilities and other land uh, infrastructure. To support innovation, it was already said that you need some good regulations to uh, accompany this movement and to facilitate, encourage innovation. It is clear that we will need to update requirements for vessels, crews, even police uh, regulations to make this innovation possible. To do so, we feel that the European uh, Committee that was set up in 2015 and is being run ever since with the direct participation and input from the Commission, but also Member States, uh, CCNI and EU and many other uh, partners, is an important instrument to develop uh, technical standards for a technical innovation. For more details on those technologies, I may also refer to our website on the studies that have been carried, uh, carried out in, in this field. And we will come back to the importance of this roadmap uh, I referred to initially. When we speak of the greening of inland navigation, um, by definition, we speak of a transition, and we will indeed face um, we will indeed face we will indeed face a long and complex transition towards this zero emission uh, by 2050. It will not happen overnight. It will take time. There is no one size fits all solution. We will need to develop those so-called transition pathways along the way towards 2050. To reach that, we will need to mobilize resources, be it technical, economic, or regulatory. We will, of course, again, need a clear roadmap to accompany this movement. When we speak of greening, 
of inland navigation, we also mean financing. And that has already been underlined. This important financial gap, which is quite a huge one, will need to be bridged. It is clear that the sector with its own resources will not be able uh, to support uh, the, the energy transition fully. We will, we will have to, to consider the current framework conditions that are not uh, entirely uh, favorable, uh, far from it, for vessel owners and operators to engage in investment in greening of their fleet. We will need, among other sources of financing and funding, a huge and important uh, uh, European funding and financing mechanism that will take different forms, but include suitable dedicated grants and financing instruments for IWT. We may consider indeed to support this with additional market-based uh, schemes to facilitate things with, for instance, a European international uh, emission labeling system uh, scheme for inland navigation. Finally, as I said, to reach uh, the, the results we, we want with this transformation uh, for inland navigation, we need this roadmap. And the CCNR, as uh, Magda reminded us, has been working already on this roadmap. We see the roadmap very much as a policy, a public policy instrument that will be absolutely necessary for the transition. It will need to be updated regularly along the way towards 2050. And we very much hope, and we saw it very much as a kind of input for the efforts of uh, the greening strategy of the European uh, Union. This roadmap will in fact define, this, this roadmap will define possible transition pathways for the fleet, according to the vessel type, it will identify measures to implement the roadmap, regulatory, voluntary, as you read, financial support and monitoring related measures. And this roadmap is about to be completed by the end of May, early June. By then, we should have already a number of uh, elements very useful for the discussions underway in the European Union. Madam Chair, I was happy to read like previous speakers and others, I'm sure that a good number of the elements that I referred to uh, were elements already reflected in your position paper. I trust and hope that uh, with your help, the help of the commission and many other actors, they will be carried forward and lead to concrete results for the good of inland navigation and for uh, European Union. I would like to thank you for your kind attention. There is, here are uh, two references uh, for those interested in the greening studies and in the SESME activities of the CCNR. Thank you again for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Giorgio from the CCNR. I think it was very relevant. One of the most important aspects I think for the sector is of course, how to finance everything and the importance of a roadmap you mentioned, I think you're fully correct. There must be a, a pathway, the pathway must be what you, what you mentioned promptly, uh, promptly identified to provide the best suit of support. And yeah, um, for the sector, certainty is very important. Certainty for the investments, because well, so to say uncertainty will cost a lot of money. So thank you for that. And I think the message to uh, the commission also to me is, is very clear. So thank you for that. Um, then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what, of course, I'm a Dutch MEP, so you, uh, you know that, that there will become also some Dutch examples uh, in a few minutes, but mm -hmm. before that, uh, it's a real pleasure for me that, well, an old friend of mine, uh, we worked together when uh, I work at the Port of Rotterdam, and uh, I had a lot of contact with, uh, with the new commission. So I'm very honored that, that uh, Mr. Manfred Seitz is here as Director General at the WIT Commission to give his view on the development of the Inland Waterway Transport in the Danube uh, countries. So thank you and Manfred, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Uh, 
it's a great pleasure and an honor uh, to speak here and in your event. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Renew Europe for its excellent position paper and for supporting uh, a strategic agenda for the European inland uh, navigation sector. Uh, the paper uh, certainly uh, is uh, full of uh, valuable uh, uh, proposals uh, and concrete proposals for future action. Uh, let me put uh, a few uh, new points uh, from the uh, Danube uh, uh, sector uh, into uh, the discussion. And uh, you might know that the Danube uh, uh, has about 40 million tons of cargo. And uh, with these volumes, uh, it makes a uh, significant contribution also for the environmentally friendly management of the cargo flows in the Danube region. And this is also a precondition for uh, several industries, uh, in particular the landlocked uh, countries uh, in the region uh, to stay competitive on the global markets. But nevertheless, uh, uh, the economic potential of uh, the Danube and the Danube ports is far from exhausted. And uh, the question is, how can we tap this uh, full potential to the benefit of the economies and the people in the region? Uh, first of all, and most important, uh, I think, is uh, that we really rebuild uh, a reliable uh, waterway infrastructure. And here I have to pay uh, uh, tribute uh, to the excellent work of uh, the Commission, uh, the Corridor Coordinator and the INEA in the last years, uh, really setting up, uh, bringing the Danube into the mind of uh, the policymakers in the region uh, when it uh, comes uh, to the infrastructure development. But nevertheless, we have to uh, improve the infrastructure. Uh, in the future and also making better use uh, uh, of uh, the various EU funds uh, uh, and to implement the missing hydrotechnical projects uh, which uh, take into account uh, climate adaptation measures and which ensure good navigation status at the same time they support uh, the good environmental status and uh, these uh, projects uh, will have to be part of the revised TNT t network. Uh, I would uh, not uh, like to hide that uh, uh, nowadays the EU environmental legislation has built up uh, a very, very high uh, challenge uh, for uh, uh, waterway projects. Uh, and uh, we really have to think about how we can uh, support the administrations also in making uh, these uh, uh, integrated navigation and environmental projects uh, uh, to become um, quicker and faster being implemented. Uh, this is a, a real issue. We also have to be aware that uh, when we uh, build up the new infrastructure uh, with the EU taxpayers' money, then it also has to be ensured uh, that uh, this infrastructure is safeguarded uh, uh, through state-of-the-art waterway maintenance. And this obligation uh, has to be also ensured with the help of uh, the revised uh, TNT regulation. And uh, my friends uh, from uh, DG Move are very much aware of this, uh, um, I'm sure. Uh, in the Danube region, uh, the river and seaports um, must be further developed into uh, green intermodal logistic hubs and priority locations for regional economic uh, development. And for this, uh, uh, a better uh, combination of EU transport and regional development uh, programs and funds is necessary. And also, uh, we have to uh, enlarge and extend uh, the motorways of the seas. Uh, uh, concept and connections uh, to the neighboring countries in the Black Sea region. There's a lot of potential uh, of cargo uh, in the Black Sea, uh, which could be uh, uh, put into the Danube region. We also need state aid schemes, which support the modernization of the Danube fleet. And uh, when I'm saying modernization of the Danube fleet, then I mean greening, but also adapting the fleet to new markets, because we are seeing that there's a change in the uh, market and we have left out a lot of uh, you know, potential markets uh, with our uh, uh, outdated uh, fleet here. Unfortunately, the recovery and resilience facility seems to become a missed funding opportunity for the fleet uh, uh, modernization. I think this is something that we really should uh, once again uh, think it over. And when talking about modernizing the inland fleet, uh, we have to see the economic opportunities in rebuilding the fleet in European shipyards with European advanced technology. And this uh, will create uh, pilot markets for European companies and will give them an advantage in the global competition. Uh, modernizing the fleet, rebuilding the European fleet is not a burden to the state households. It's an economic opportunity for uh, many uh, businesses. Uh, well, uh, however, uh, when we uh, uh, invest into green vessels, uh, 
we uh, must create a business case and economic advantage for the operators. And uh, for this, uh, we have to provide an attractive regulatory framework, uh, including reduced fees for ports and canals, tax incentives, the implementation of the polluter pace principle, and we have also to ensure a fair level playing field in relation to rail and road. I think this is also uh, really uh, uh, important. Greening the fleet uh, requires clean alternative fuels. And uh, as my friend Bruno said, uh, in the transition phase uh, of the next 10, 15 years, we will see various technical solutions. Uh, and he said uh, that uh, one technical solution doesn't fit all. And uh, I uh, really uh, uh, think that we have to be aware that uh, the solutions will depend on the type of vessels and on the operational profile. Uh, and therefore, uh, technology open EU funded flagship research and innovation projects will be essential to generate a critical mass of uh, uh, these new vessels and thus uh, also uh, generate the critical demand for alternative fuel, which can trigger the investment in alternative uh, fueling infrastructure. Hydrogen is one of those very promising fuels, and therefore, uh, we should provide a regulatory framework. Uh, for using uh, hydrogen as a cargo and uh, as a fuel in all kinds, uh, uh, as a fuel cell, as NOHC, uh, uh, liquid and uh, compressed or whatever. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy uh, to see that uh, the European Union Hydrogen IPSA initiative uh, already uh, combines and integrates uh, uh, projects uh, where the, uh, the new ports uh, and the new operators uh, uh, will be involved and the ports um, uh, seem to become, with help of this initiative, uh, hubs for green energy production and distribution. And uh, uh, we also see projects where uh, the green energy will be distributed by barge uh, when on the Danube. So okay, this is a, a very good uh, development. Uh, Mark uh, pointed out the, the importance of digitalization. Uh, I think uh, just have to mention that the risk directive, uh, the revised risk directive uh, could be a very strong instrument uh, uh, to trigger the further uh, uh, digitalization and uh, thus uh, realizing the vision of smart vessels using smart infrastructure. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have to invest significantly in people. And uh, this refers also very much to the Danube region and people working on the vessels in the ports and in the companies along the waterborne supply chain. But we also have to strengthen the institutional capacity uh, uh, the human resources and skills in the waterway and port administration and in the relevant public administrations, because this will provide a better framework condition uh, for EU funded projects, programs and policies and policy initiatives. All these proposed measures require a, a joint political vision for Europe uh, and a strong coordination and complementary actions uh, on the EU member states and relevant third countries. Therefore, I, I'm certainly able to say that the uh, stakeholders uh, in the Danube region welcome very much the idea uh, of a comprehensive NIADE three action program. And uh, I fully agree also with the position paper of Renew Europe uh, that for this we need a collective push forward as you uh, uh, said in the, in the conclusions of your paper. But this is especially because not all the policy makers and administrators uh, up to now are aware that we can only achieve the ambitious goals of the Green Deal with a strong and fundamentally modernized uh, inland waterway sector. And uh, the non-inclusion of waterway infrastructure in the list of sustainable investment uh, items in the EC proposal of the delegated acts and the taxonomy regulation shows also that this push has uh, also uh, to come urgently and is urgent, uh, we need this push urgently. So thank you very much for your attention. It was a great pleasure. Yes, thank you, Monster. Thank you for your, for your words. And yes, I was, uh, well, you said, of course, a lot of very good things, but one of the things were, which is very close to my heart is the way you mentioned the fact that there is not one solution for fits all regarding greening uh, the sector, because I think it's so important here is an, let's say efficiently planned, tailor-made infrastructure, really based on the demand uh, and on the characteristics of the inland uh, waterway sector. So that's, well, let's just say oversupply in areas uh, if you avoid it. So it should be furthermore taken into account to meet the market characteristics. Uh, I fully agree with you on that, uh, on that point. So thank you for that. Uh, well, I already announced it that we are 
move on with some uh, Dutch uh, examples, so to say. And the first one I would like to introduce is uh, Martin Quispel. He is the senior expert project uh, manager at the Dutch Expertise and Innovation Center for Inland Waterway Transport. I know he has some great projects uh, on sustainability and digitalization. So Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caroline, for, for this uh, opportunity to uh, give a very brief overview of some, uh, some projects we are doing. Uh, I believe different projects in the context of the previous uh, speakers as well. I will try to share my screen and uh, uh, I hope that it works. Do you see the presentation? Yes, Martin, we can see the presentation. Yeah, okay, okay, good, thank you. Yes, um, yeah, the good news is that uh, we started uh, very recently with a project, uh, Platina 3. It's the, the platform for the implementation of a future inland navigation action uh, program, uh, well, also known, of course, as the upcoming Nayades 3 action program uh, to be expected over the next weeks. Uh, we already uh, made a, a proposal and uh, have a contract with the uh, European Commission to provide coordination and support actions for this new NIADES 3 uh, uh, program. We have a budget of 2 million euro to spend and uh, the project will be running. St we started in January, so we are still in the starting up phase, but we will uh, do so quite a lot of work until June 2023. Uh, and here you see the main objectives, of course, which are also mentioned already, the model share, the zero emission, to have a competitive and safe, but also climate resilient and integrated uh, in the synchro model supply chains. And uh, also, of course, the workforce is uh, not forgotten in, uh, in our new project. So what the specific uh, objectives are of our Platina 3 project is to really yeah, connect the dots, uh, which you also see in the logo, uh, to bring together policymakers, industry, researchers, uh, key stakeholders, experts, other uh, projects uh, working on innovations in inland waterway transport and to really consolidate everything and, and try to be really to to function as a catalyst as a platform uh, for supporting this European cooperation to make the sector much stronger. So for that reason we will uh, develop a research and innovation and development roadmap specifically dedicated to the EBT sector um, and also a policy implementation plan for action. So we will also very closely work together with uh, the colleagues from uh, from DG Move and his t the team of Huck van Honecker. And last but not least, of course, we will have a, a, an active dissemination action with a website, etc., LinkedIn, where you can uh, hopefully soon also start following us. Uh, as we are starting up now, uh, we expect the website to be uh, operational, uh, I think, from, uh, from next uh, month onwards. Um, so we are very blessed with our uh, consortium. Uh, I think it's really a unique project which uh, brings together all the key organizations which have a strong role now in this um, in the execution of the Nayada 3. Uh, so we are leading uh, the, the project, but we have Via Do now who, who coordinated the, the previous two Platina 1 and 2 projects, which supported the Nayadas 1 and Nayadas 2 action programs. We have Sea Europe representing the stakeholders from shipyards. We have the Inland Navigation Europe organization. Um, of course, the River Commissions, which is uh, uh, new, um, they really have now a strong direct involvement in the project, uh, CCNR, Danube Commission, uh, the Pro Danube Management Organization, who does a lot of work on the Danube side. Uh, but also you see there the representation of the Transport Workers Federation, um, also the, the, the BLN, the representation of the, the Skippers uh, Organization. Uh, also education institutes, the SCC group, but also the Maritime Academy Harlingen. They will work together on the, uh, the new challenges in view of uh, autonomization and zero emission uh, systems. And last but not least, of course, the sector is uh, deeply involved through the uh, IWT platform with the, uh, uh, the organization uh, for, for the European Barge Union and the European Skippers. Uh, organization and yeah last but not least also the shippers the the cargo owners who have a strong role also in in, in promoting inland waterway transport and uh, also choosing for more green transport so here you see a brief overview of the project structure i unfortunately we don't have time to really go into the details of all the different tasks we have already uh, uh, um, defined but you see here the 
uh, the market block a fleet the jobs and skills the infrastructure and everywhere there is the are these horizontal themes of increasing the innovation digitization autonomization the competitiveness and the economic viability including also the big question of financing uh, and last but not least this regulatory framework and and the and the good cooperation with the member states especially through the uh, river commissions which are now very closely involved in this uh, project and here in work package five you see then the result of all that content work done uh, uh, in work packages one two and four uh, where we provide the roadmaps and uh, the dissemination platforms and also some key milestone events uh, we call the platina stages uh, from which you will certainly hear more of um, so that will be a, a very good project, but we have also uh, the opportunity to get uh, synergy with other projects, for example, with uh, Horizon 2020 projects, uh, Steerer, uh, making the zero emission waterborne transport research agenda, Novi Move, who fo which focuses on innovation specifically for the uh, synchromodal integration. Lasting, also a new project started on promotion and communication of more research and innovation in waterborne transport, including, of course, also inland waterway transport. Novi Mar, who is working on the vessel train and automation in inland waterway transport. Uh, yeah, and as uh, Mr. Bruno George already uh, mentioned, we have also um, a strong role in studies uh, ongoing for the new uh, energy transition. Um, and on, on national level in the Netherlands, we are working closely with the Dutch ministry on the execution of the Dutch Green Deal, where we um, developed a blueprint together with the ministry and a lot of stakeholders for the emission label. And also, as you, some of you might know, the Dutch ministry is uh, planning a, a new uh, legislation on the mandatory blending of biofuels uh, in the framework of, of the renewable energy directive from the European uh, Union. Um, yeah, what are we also doing, but uh, that's also on national level, is management and executive grant schemes. For example, there's an 80 million euro, euro budget now for retrofitting of uh, catalyst systems for existing uh, engines. Um, and we are working a lot closely with uh, suppliers in the industry, like engine manufacturers or after treatment suppliers or new fuels, uh, battery systems, hydrogen, etc. in our so-called innovation lab, where we'll try to really to collaborate and jointly uh, develop new uh, services and uh, technical solutions for the sector, but also look into the the, the policy side and some barriers there. So I'm sure that, uh, yeah, we have a good position uh, to support the, the also the new challenges in the Naya industry. So I think, yeah, that's a, just a very brief overview of what we are doing. I hope you can find us uh, on LinkedIn and soon also our new Platina 3 project where we will uh, do a lot of interesting work. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you for your uh, great uh, insights in all the projects that are going on uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the work and especially in the Dutch Expertise and Innovation Center. So many thanks. Um, and then we have also here the president of the Waterborne Technology Platform, uh, Mr. Henk Prins. I'm very pleased that he will be here. He will be focused more on the shipbuilders, on the topics of research and uh, sustainability. So Henk, uh, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Caroline. I'll also try to share my screen. So hopefully you see my presentation now. Yeah. Okay, I'm here representing the Waterborne Technology Platform <clears throat> and focusing today, of course, on, on inland waterway transport. Um, so what is the, um, uh, the, uh, the platform about? Uh, we are a European technology platform. There are many different kinds of European technology platforms, but we focus on, focus on the waterborne sector. Um, we combine in our association all kinds of waterborne stakeholders like ship owners, ship builders, uh, the equipment suppliers, uh, people from the infrastructure like ports, um, but we also have research institutes and, and universities. And the aim is to have a, a, a continuous dialogue between our members, the European Commission, European institutes and, and member states on a common medium and long-term research agenda. And we call ourselves waterborne and many people use the words waterborne now and I'm very pleased to hear that because it combines the maritime navigation and the inland navigation. Um, we're both working together towards the same goals. Um, and as a waterborne platform, we are uh, entering into a partnership with the European Commission on zero emission waterborne transport. 
Um, and it's a very ambitious uh, partnership. Um, the aim of the partnership is to provide and demonstrate zero emission solutions for all main ship types um, and services by 2030. So all the technology should be ready in 2030 to be implemented in the sector and eventually by 2050. Of course, it takes a long time to implement things in our sector as we have many ships and many ships are and ships are quite old and, and used for quite some time. Um, and when we talk about zero emission, uh, we talk, of course, about greenhouse gas emissions, but also other air pollutants and also water pollutants. So it was mentioned already by the Czech uh, minister saying, OK, yeah, it, ships are considered to be polluting. Um, so, yes, we want to tackle also water pollution, noise, underwater noise that can also be, be a problem. Um, so it's not just about greenhouse gas. We tackle all kinds of pollutions. We really want to go to a zero emission uh, in mo mode of transport. And today, of course, we focus on, on uh, inland shipping in this, this webinar. We have many objectives as, as a partnership for, for hydro, hydro using alternative fuels like hydrogen, electrification, energy efficiency. But one of our objectives is very specific for the inland waterway sector, where we say we want to develop solutions for clean and climate neutral, but also climate resilient uh, inland waterway vessels. Uh, and it was mentioned already earlier, uh, I saw it in the chat, um, the, the, the very low water levels in the summer period can be a problem as well for our sector. So it's the climate resilience of the sector is also very important to, to tackle. And it's therefore an objective of our partnership. Um, we have a defined implementation pathways. We, you, can, you can think of all kinds of new technologies, but then we, we have uh, put forward some visions of how we think this technology will enter into the market. And for inland navigation vessels, we say, OK, uh, there should be a prime focus on retrofitting technologies because vessels are used for such a long time. You cannot just replace the whole fleet over the next couple of years. Um, so you have to switch fuels, uh, alternative fuels, alternative sustainable fuels for uh, used in, in uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, preferably, if that is possible, switch to electric drivetrain so you make your vessel more future proof if you go to alternative uh, propulsion means. And what we now see uh, coming up is the what we call the containerized solution. So you have containers providing a solution for the vessel, alternative power for the vessel, instead of having it integrated into the vessel. Of course, with new builds, you want to probably integrate all these kinds of new technologies into the vessels like batteries and, and hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, and new builds will also uh, benefit a lot from pro uh, uh, increased energy efficiency because we see that many of the inland vessels are quite old and not as efficient as would be possible with new ships. So new builds, of course, would be much more energy efficient. So we focus on both on the retrofitting and the new builds. Uh, looking at batteries and uh, electrification and hydrogen solutions. Um, and then some, some examples, uh, what's already going on, at least in projects uh, that are uh, being, being run. Electrification, containerized uh, battery packs uh, in an islands on the shorter distances, let's say uh, up to, to, to 50 kilometers. Uh, they use these, um, these, these containers as this are shown here on the front of the vessel. Um, of course, it can only be used for, for, for shorter uh, ranges because if you would, for longer ranges, use, use batteries, you have the weight of the batteries that is still a big problem for inland vessels. It will increase the draft. If only it increases the draft a little bit, it is already a problem in summertime. Um, for, for maritime, of course, it is a different issue, but for inland vessels, the draft is very important. So battery weight is a bottleneck when you go to electrification. There's also a project now under development for uh, for hydrogen uh, on the corridor from uh, from Rotterdam to to, to Germany. Uh, the first vessels uh, using uh, PEM fuel cells. Of course, with hydrogen you can go for longer ranges, <clears throat> but also here they were still looking at the moment for containerized solutions. So put fuel cells or hydrogen tanks in a container on deck, so you can have easily swap the containers. This is because there's no technology yet available to fully integrate this into the ship uh, structure, into the ship design, uh, the, 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 the fuel tanks, the, 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 the fuel cells. But also, there's also no regulation yet how to bunker hydrogen in, in such vessels. So there's no possibility to apply it yet. So there's a lot of things still need to be done uh, to integrate these technologies really into the vessel. We sometimes compare these containerized solutions by saying, OK, if you would develop an electric car and you need batteries, you put them just on the back bench. Uh, that would work. You have an electric car, but you lose cargo space or uh, you have less passengers in your vessel. The same happens here. And what you need to do is really integrate them into the, uh, into the ships. So a lot of things still to do. 
but good initiatives uh, going on. Um, as a waterborne platform, we're not just looking at zero emission. We also look, but this was mentioned already with, with, uh, by others, uh, on connected and automated waterborne uh, transport is very important for the smaller canals to have uh, uh, automated barges. Uh, safety of transport, we shouldn't uh, keep uh, forget about the safety of vessels. Accidents still happen and can have a, a big uh, problem in the, in the transport uh, sector. Um, and of course, the security. If you go to digitization, you, your vessels have to be digitally secure as well. And finally, let's not forget the full integration of the maritime transport and the hinterland logistic in inland shipping, the connection in ports to make that as optimal as possible to also save energy as well there. Thank you very much for this time to, to quickly present the Waterborne platform. If you have any questions, you can contact us uh, and find the information on our website. Thank you very yes, much. many thanks, Hank, for your presentation. And I have to say also the lovely picture in your presentation. Of course, the background is great, but the pictures you show are fantastic. So thank you for that and for the examples you mentioned there are, I think, also for the sector and for the audience, very, very interesting. Let's move on. Um, we have still two speakers, maybe one teaser. Uh, the last speaker will be Femke Brennigmeyer. There was a great press release yesterday. So uh, stay tuned. But before we go to Femka, I would like to give the floor to Turi Vioti. Uh, I think most of you know him. He's the Director General of the European Federation of Inland Ports. Uh, he's very active uh, always, and we have a very good contact with him. So uh, also thank you for that, of course. But I would like to give him the floor and to dive a bit into the role of the inland ports in the model shift and also into the urban mobility solutions. So Turi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you also for your kind words. Uh, good morning once again to everybody. Let me start by sharing my screen here for all of you because I have some interesting things to show. I hope this is coming up properly, yes. Um, so after all of these uh, very good speakers uh, already this morning, I'd like to take a moment to look at the perspective of the inland ports for the future of inland shipping. Um, because we very much see inland ports as the place where all the green modes of transport of Europe are already coming together and will also be coming together in the future. Uh, here you see an image of how we already see our future looking. So an inland port will be a place where uh, green inland vessels come together, both large and small, where there is a big role for both local <clears throat> uh, logistics, uh, for multimodality, and these ports will also be an energy hub. Uh, but what do we need to do? Because this is still uh, somewhat further away. Oh. Um, a first big thing is that we have to focus very much on this question of multimodality. Um, inland waterways is a system that does not only work on its own, it is very dependent on how it works with other modes of transport to get the goods to where they need to be. Um, on the one hand, it's very important that we get uh, our 10 t network to be fully functional and ready for the future, and we are making good strides on this. One of the most important things from our perspective is that inland ports are well connected to railways. Uh, but to meet the Green Deal goal of uh, more <clears throat> multimodal freight on railways and inland waterways, we also need to look at the digital side. If we can get data to work together in a more efficient way than it does today, uh, we will be able to make multimodal transport very competitive with road or other forms of transportation. An example here that you see on the screen is from the upper Rhine ports that are developing a system in which uh, inland shipping and railway systems and the terminals in between will be connected, uh, allowing for very quick planning, uh, ETA calculations, and through planning. So you could plan your container from your vessel all the way to your uh, train. Um, and in this way, you will see that there can be a very much an increase in uh, success for these types of transport. And this system, even though it's still in its infancy, has already shown a lot of success for uh, the ports that have implemented it. Another thing that we haven't talked about today, but that's quite important for us, and I would like to focus on uh, for a moment uh, this morning, is city logistics. Many European cities are located on uh, some sort of waterway system. 
And this gives a lot of short range options. We talk a lot about long range freight because of course that is the biggest chunk of the market and will most likely remain to be so. However, we can see in many of our larger cities that are battling congestion, um, air pollution and other issues that inland waterways and the ports that work with them can provide for different solutions. I have some examples here on the screen. On the left-hand side, you see uh, in the port of Lyon, a uh, initiative that is being ramped up of uh, freight collection, uh, sorry, waste collection in the middle of the city. So instead of you having to drive out to the, uh, the periphery of your city to get rid of your heavier trash, this vessel comes in once or twice a week. You can walk up to it, take your bike up to it, maybe your car if it's slightly too far, too heavy. And then you can deposit your trash here and the vessel can take it straight to the recycling or processing plant. This saves a lot of congestion, a lot of truck transport motions, uh, and helps reduce the con congestion in the city. On the right-hand side, I have an example uh, in Paris, where uh, the uh, supermarket chain uh, uh, Prix has been uh, testing to use inland ships to supply its local supermarkets. And these supermarkets, of course, uh, any one of you will know that Paris is highly congested, by being able to take all of these trucks off the road uh, and, all, and bringing these containers into the city and then distributing all the goods to the relevant local supermarkets saves a lot of time and becomes a lot more efficient. In the future, we expect and hope that these types of initiatives will grow and become much more commonplace. And we'll also need uh, support for uh, the development of smaller scale innovations and business models. Right now, like I said before, most of our sector is based on long range, as many goods as possible on a vessel, and that's a good business model. But we believe that on the side of that, we also need this new type of business. So these were my additions to what the previous speakers have already said. Uh, and as um, we're talking about the future and what we need, and I've quickly summarized uh, what I, what we believe needs to be done in the coming years. First, we need to roll out the European uh, alternative fuels infrastructure for inland waterway transport. Uh, as Caroline already said, this is going to have to be done in a smart way that we don't oversaturate, your, uh, sorry, oversaturate certain parts of the network while under-servicing other parts, which is a possible danger. And that as the work of Bruno George and uh, Martin Crispel have said uh, that we have a roadmap of what type of fuels we will be using in the future. And I'm uh, the, the news that Caroline already alluded to that's coming after my presentation. I'm quite excited to hear that one as well because I saw the press release, but it's a good sign of the things that are to come. Um, second, like I said, we need this strong multimodal 10T network. This means uh, a good network of a core and a comprehensive inland waterway network, but also the connections to rail and road so that we can become the most efficient, so that we can choose, that the shippers can choose the mode of transport that is the greenest and the most efficient. But with that, we also need a common data framework for multimodal transport. Right now, this doesn't exist. There are a lot of um, initiatives that are working to see this become a reality, uh, but without it, the modal shift or multimodal transport will not be possible. We need to use um, the tools that we have to make that a reality. Uh, these are my priorities for the future. Uh, and given the time, I will give it back to Caroline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Turin. Thank you for your uh, presentation, but also for the three points you mentioned. I think it keeps us in the parliament also, well, let's say quite sharp that we really should focus on these three important needs. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost at the end of this uh, webinar. And of course, you are able to ask a few questions, but we are a bit running out of time. But as I promised, uh, the last speaker will be Van Pentrenigmeijer, the CEO of the uh, organization. Uh, well, and hopefully she will uh, tell us about the press release and the great initiative uh, we saw yesterday in the paper. So please, Tanka. The five minutes are for you. Thanks a lot. I uh, prepared a pitch, like a pitch. So, um, if you drive a car, live in a house, or use cosmetics, 
you are an indirect customer of Colvestro, a polymer producer in Germany. And since the 1st January of, of this year, the NPRC transport 1.5 million tons of salt uh, per year from Hengelo to Dormagen, Leverkusen and Erdingen. And this is a raw material for the production process of Covestro and just basic raw material for all kinds of products that are made and that uh, we use on a uh, daily basis. From battery housing in laptops to the frames of our glasses. Covestro is one of the biggest polymer producers and takes its environmental responsibilities. All the way through the production process, they try to minimize pollution and their CO2 footprint. But how about further up the chain? There, Diana Sacco, mother of three children, is a skipper on the MS Arist Aristo. She is part of the 12 ships who together create a salt uh, shuttle between Holland and Germany. And her ship carries an equivalent of 120 trucks every week. As a barge captain, Diana is greener than a trucker and greener than a machinist. But still, her barge sails on gas oil. And there is sustainability to be gained. Yesterday, Covesto, together with the MPC, announced that we will develop two hydrogen ships and have them sailing by 2024. And working together in the supply chain leads to zero emission transport. Transport. That's what really working together can do. My name is Femke Brenningmey. I'm the CEO of the MPRC. It's the largest inland shipping cooperative company in Europe. 135 skippers united in collaboration. To be stronger together in a world where everything and everyone is only getting bigger. So I speak on behalf of 135 captains, but also on behalf of 135 entrepreneurs. You may see those ships passing by very occasionally. They have an orange flag. We transport 12 million tons of cargo per year, and every single day around 200 ships set course in our name. In accordance with the Green Deal, the aim is to make shipping sustainable and to develop zero emission inland vessels. As Europe, we should be a driver of innovative shipbuilding concepts to create innovation and jobs, and also important to attract young and bright people to the maritime sector. We should take steps to start testing, to create skill and to develop knowledge. We have to achieve achieve this great ambition that lies ahead with small steps. And practically, we need the following in which I'll, I will be very clear. I prepared four wishes. When you work on innovation and pilots and crossroads where nobody has ever been as zero emission projects, you need a good doses of common sense, drive, courage, flexibility, vulnerability, and journey and angelic patience. That's one. Next, most shipping entrepreneurs would like to become more sustainable, but do not know how. They struggle with regulations that are not in line with the te technology and with obligations that are not properly coordinate, coordinated with the sector. And so we need to listen to the indiv individual skippers if you want to make these small steps. Financially, the skippers are now experiencing no financial benefits for their green investments, but instead they are experiencing extra costs and a higher price for the hydrogen. It's time to also put the benefits to the skipper and certainly to the skippers who dare to stick their necks out. Those are, to my opinion, the real heroes. Once the skippers switch to hydrogen, he's at the mercy of others. We should take on sustainability together with the supply chain, with the whole supply chain. Inland shipping does not stand alone. It's not a separate product. We must think and act much more integrally. I therefore advocate to focus on the whole supply chain instead of just focusing on the ship that carries the cargo. So let me be clear, skippers cannot manage on their own. And yes, in cooperative context as the MPRC, you have power and leverage, and you can set your goals a little bit higher together. 
that we need the government and the industry are also uh, to, to make the steps. The emphasis is together we can do so much more. I have it in my screen. And I'm convinced that if we want to change, be more sustainable and digitize, we must do this together in transparency, in vulnerability, and with confidence. Caroline has made a nice start for this. She's someone who involves others in her plans and who takes the time to openly discuss it. I think she's a good example, and I'm convinced that we should do this much more. And in any case, I hope that several of our skippers will dare to pioneer once more and take this step to zero emission and thus generate big impact with small steps. But this big responsibility should not lie alone with the small men and women on, on the end and their ship. Thank you. Thank you, Femke. Thank you for your, your lovely uh, words. And I think you're, you're fully touched the right thing uh, about, about this, well, really important uh, topic. So, so many, many thanks for that. And hopefully what, what you already said that we can work together in the future on all these uh, relevant elements. So super, super thanks. Um, and also uh, good luck and success with, with the new project. I think it's very good for the sector and shows how proactive uh, all of you are. Um, I'm looking, of course, at the, also at the time. And what I would like to suggest that I took out from the chat three questions. Uh, I would like to uh, ask um, uh, to, the, to the speakers to react on that. Uh, and because of the time, we have to be, uh, well, a bit, uh, well, let's say, try to focus it on, on, on two speakers. I have two questions for the commission. Um, and I have one question for Tui. So that would I like to suggest that I will read out the questions first for the commission and then for Tui and if they would like to react, uh, please. So the first question to the commission is from Anna uh, Gomez. And her question is the rhyme suffered from climate change, a dramatic changes in the water level, sometimes too high and sometimes too low, and that occur more often than before and it leads to traffic interruption. So the question is, is this taking also into account in the strategy? So that's the first question. And the second question, so then I can give the floor to, to Magda to respond to both of them. Uh, the second question is from Ben Melissa. Uh, very much welcome, Ben, of the Danse Group. And his question to Magda is, how are you planning to include SMEs in your ambitious plans, knowing that the inland shipping industry market is different organized compared to other mobilities? Please, Magda, uh, feel free to uh, give a uh, short answer to these two questions. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Very, very good questions. And I wish we had more time to have uh, more lengthy discussion. Indeed, we are well aware of the difficult situation, not just on the Rhine, but also on the Danube, or maybe even more on the Danube. And uh, looking at uh, the next um, TENTI uh, framework, we will be trying to make sure that possible uh, funding and financing is available to make to, to, to make up, if I may say so, for the impacts of climate change. But frankly speaking, let's not cheat ourselves. With, with inland waterways, we are at the mercy of the climate change happening. And we really have to make sure that we do all we can across the entire economy to try to limit those impacts. We, we, will, be, we will be aiming to put, to put financing and funding available. And yes, we will have this element of, of the need for climate adaptation, climate resilience, but also resilience within the sector so that it can function even in the unforeseeable uh, circumstances, but but as as with everything else, that there are there are issues that are that are that cannot be completely controlled. But since you're asking whether we are going to take it into consideration in the strategy, yes, we are. But of course, I couldn't just give a short answer because you know me; I can't speak shortly. Um, second question concerning SMEs. Yes, we, we know the sector is, is, is organized differently. This is why, for example, we, we always aim for, for legal instruments or support uh, instruments 
dedicated to that sector. We know we cannot throw inland waterways transport into a basket with all other transport modes. We know that that uh, in terms of, again, financial support, because I know this is something that, that everybody has very much uh, fo in focus, uh, there need to be dedicated uh, schemes that will work for the sector. But I think on this one, I also need to, to make an appeal on, on, on national governments and member states, because especially with the, with the RRF, with the, with the recovery program, member states have actually a chance to, to do something um, more dedicated to, to companies in the sector. But because we are talking SMEs, we know that a longer transition is needed, a lot of uh, cooperation and involvement of, of um, SMEs uh, is needed. And we also make sure that whatever we are developing, we have um, expert groups and discussion fora where governance of what's happening of the sector is done in a way that, that those individual smaller companies um, are involved. But you know what it also takes for the companies to be active. I know many of them are, we just heard one as the last speaker, well, not really a company, a cooperative, but still speaking on behalf of 135 skippers and entrepreneurs. But it's important that you also speak up and you speak up to us, you speak up to your members of European Parliament and you also speak up to your national governments. I stop here, thank you. Thank you, Marta. Well, and to be honest, it was a very concrete and short answer. So thank you for that. And uh, the last question I would like to, from, the, from the audience is for Tori. From the AFIP, and this is a question regarding uh, the onshore power electricity and the role of inland ports. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, in in well, it's part of the, of the of the Green Deal. And how would you like to see the implementation of this technology, and what should be the role of the inland ports regarding the onshore power electricity? To replace a very short answer. Uh, Caroline, thank you. Um, I mean, this is going to be a relatively simple question, I believe. Um, under EU regulations, we need to roll out onshore power supplies in inland ports, uh, following core and comprehensive uh, timelines. And that is what we are going to do. Uh, that's what many of us are already doing and trying to also employ uh, European funding to achieve this. And there are, through Seth and others, there are good avenues for this. It's still a process that we have to go to. Uh, but I am, and my members were quite positive and very committed to doing this. Um, we also have to get uh, the users, so the shippers, to use the onshore power supply. In most cases now, this is a thing that they do, but it doesn't always work yet perfectly. Um, yes, I can only say that it's what we're, I mean, I wish I could give you a more difficult or more exciting, but it's what one of our main priorities and it's what we're working on. And in the coming years, uh, you will hear more and more news of onshore power supply being fully active in our ports. Yeah, super true. Well, we definitely will come back to you regarding you know, regarding this topic and all the uh, new proposals from the Commission are popping up and will, of course, for the Parliament. Before I close, I'm very happy that Jose Ramon Bauza, my colleague uh, from Renew, is uh, here as well. Uh, and well, maybe also thanks to him, I was able to organize this webinar so I would like to give the floor for, uh, to uh, Jose Ramon for some, uh, for some remarks from his side. Jose Ramon, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you, all of the speakers and participants that had decided to join us this morning. There is this webinar organized by Renew Europe. We really appreciate your time. I hope that you had available interesting discussion. Dear colleagues, I do not want to conclude this webinar without dedicated, uh, dedicating a bit of time to congratulate my dear colleague and friend Caroline Natigal on her work and at the Tran Committee during this first year and a half of period of legislature, but also to dedicate some very special words to her, if you allow me, Caroline, because if you don't allow me, I will do in fact again. <laughs> <laughs> then, Caroline, I want you to know that Caroline is one of the most valuable members of the Renew Europe group and has an, and I am very, very glad and proud that she is part of the Transport and Tourism Committee. She's a very well-known member of the Parliament due to his work, perseverance and positive attitude, but also for, his, for her extraordinary professional career. Original from Rotterdam, Caroline is more than proud of her city and she has actively contributed 
to its progress and reputation around the world. With years of large experience in the port of Rotterdam and the airport of Schiphol, Caroline knows perfectly all details and the specificities of the transport industry. With his with this fantastic background, and she works every every day in our group as a politician, but also as most important as an expert. She works very hard in a trans committee to eliminate barriers for businesses and workers of the transport sector to ensure a level playing field and to guarantee that the European Union invests efficiently in crucial infrastructure. For all this reason, I had no doubt that she is our member in charge of Mar Europe and who better than Caroline to host today this webinar on a future proof inland waterway transport. As some of you very well know, and some of you have mentioned it during this intervention, inland navigation is very important for many European countries. The total share of cross-border freight in, uh, by our inland waterways is 54% on the Rhine-Alpine corridor, 35% of the North Sea Mediterranean corridor, and even 38% of the North Sea Baltic corridor. These figures show how important it is to advance in the completion of the 10T corridor inland waterways core network. European countries have very different fleets on inland vessels, which makes inland waterway transport very convenient and useful for transporting different types of cargo to different destinations of Europe. And completely aware of the importance of this mode of transport in Europe, its figures and challenges renew Europe thanks 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 to Caroline, has taken the lead and recently adopted a position paper on inland water world transport. Yes, because of Caroline and his four. We have now a common and strategic position on, in our group on inland water world transport, but also and more important, a roadmap to address the challenges of the sector in the union. With this paper and with this webinar, Renew Europe want to demonstrate once again its commitment to advocate for a European comprehensive and a strategic plan to help the transport sector in this major transition and in these difficult times. European transport to the uh, European support, sorry, to the inland waterway transport sector, whose potential has been insufficiently exploited, proves every more important today. And in this regard, with the strategic agenda for future proof inland waterway transport in the Union, Renew Europe takes the first step in this direction in order to incentivize a discussion on this very important issue. I would like to conclude by enunciating that the European Parliament will launch this year an our initiative report on inland water water transport and our group has been crucial to achieve this opportunity to work on this initiative, which will be differently promote the debate and the response of the European Union to the challenges of the sector. This will be a very good opportunity, and I'm sure that Caroline, together with all Renew Trump members, will, acti will actively contribute to this initiative with her expertise and knowledge. Uh, finally, dear Caroline. I just want to, to say you that we also count on your contributions with all the points of view of, this, uh, of, your, of, the, of you, of your speakers, and made important being the sector stronger, sustainable, and resilient. I just want to say thank you again to, to Caroline. Uh, as I said before, she's one of the most important point of members of our group. And I want you to know that more of the things that are involved in the maritime sector wouldn't be able possible without the help and lead of Caroline. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose Juan, for your very, very kind words. Well, to all of you, I was not asking him to, to say this, so I'm a bit blushing to be honest, but thank you because, well, most of you, all of you know that my heart, uh, well, is, is there uh, for a very long time for the sector. And um, so I'm very, I'm very happy with this. And he mentioned, uh, already or announced that the, the, the new report is coming up. So hopefully I can uh, can have a, have a leading role in this. So you can put pressure on Jose Ramon, call him by 0034. No, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking. But hopefully I can, I can have a leading role in that report and that I can count on the sector as well. 
So for now, I would like to conclude, not by wrapping up in 20 minutes, but only to thank all the speakers for their great contributions and the expert the stakeholders. It was so important to have this webinar. Together, we are working on a sustainable, greener, more digital inland waterway sector. You are doing great things in the sector. So again, thank you to the speakers, to the participants, to the whole audience, and a special thanks because it's always very tricky when you have an online event. I really would like to uh, thank my colleagues from the Renew Group who make this possible. Uh, the technical support, all the members from uh, the Renew, the policy advisor who make this able, and my own policy advisor, Joost, thank you so much for helping with this event. It was great to have you here. All the best. My door is always open. Now it's difficult, of course, in these COVID times, but you know you can send me an app, send me an email, or call me. Please uh, find me, know me, uh, that you're always, uh, well, I can, can tell you all your opinions, and uh, I will listen to you, and I'll do my best for the sector. Thank you, and have a